Good evening. The title of this final program in the current Urban Mosaic series is How to Become Lovely People. This needs an explanation. Tonight we will deal with a unique, a remarkable effort in this community that more of you ought to know about, the nursery school at the Jewish Community Center. I asked one of the mothers there a couple of weeks ago who's involved in the school through the War and Poverty Fund, uh, what was really going on? She said, Mr. Dynam, we are all becoming lovely, lovely people. This program then is to me a telling counterpoint to the first program I did here last September with women who were on ADC, who spoke their minds about being poor. All very lovely women, but women who felt that under the impersonal attitude of the uh, uh, officials they dealt with and the prejudices from their community, they were becoming less and less lovely all the time. Uh, with me tonight is the director of the nursery school at the Jewish Community Center, Helen Gordon. I cannot imagine the nursery school without Helen. As a matter of fact, I cannot imagine Portland without Helen. Now tonight we're going to deal with one aspect of what goes on in this school. So I will, I'm going to start out by asking Helen to tell us a little bit about the broad picture of the school. Well, maybe I ought to first put the nursery school into a context of the whole center right. and give you a little history and then bring it up to date. Historically, the whole Jewish center movement dates back to really the turn of the century. This was when Jewish immigrants were coming primarily from Eastern Europe to escape a, uh, from deprivation, from pogroms, from all of the uh, miseries that they had. And they came to this country needed to be acclimated, to be brought into the mainstream, as one talks about it, to know about the organizations and the services. That's how the center movement got started, to help these people. Now, with that as a history, the nursery school really fits that right, part. Right. In that we have, uh, prior to even the War on Poverty funds, brought together in the nursery school at the Portland Jewish Community Center a wide spread grouping of children and their families who needed to learn each from the other and learn about what are the services they can use. So we've had normal and we've had handicapped children. Handicapped to what degree? Well, we've had, I'll use the current picture to tell you, we've got in our three-year-old group a profoundly deaf child whose parents are deaf-mute. The only person who speaks in that house and is not getting enough of it is a tiny little brother. We have children who are blind, we've had children with orthopedic handicaps, we've had children who have emotional handicaps, children who are mentally retarded. We also have had children of a variety of races, a variety of socioeconomic groups, mm -hmm. Negro, white, Mexican, Japanese, and so on. This is a setting in which you want to get everybody to contribute from their cultural heritage mm -hmm. and learn from each other and make use of the cultural heritage in which they live now. And how does it work out in practice? Well, I think it works out very well. I think that, um, I know I've learned a great deal. I've learned from the handicapped children a great many things about how everybody mm -hmm. learns. I've learned new words from many of the Negro families, and here and there I can even sing you a Japanese song. <laughs> but how does it work, uh, I mean, uh, in practical terms? How is it organized? It means oh. quite a big All staff. Right. What happened, in staff-wise, we have some paid staff and then a tremendous amount of volunteers. Each age group in the nursery school, each class group, has a trained teacher, a professionally trained teacher in charge, and one paid aide, teacher aide, whom we train sometimes on the job. And then, in the project that we now have under the Economic Opportunities Act, we have the services of a full-time social worker. We also have contractual services with the Portland Bureau of Health for a nurse. We have a part-time doctor, and then we have a couple of other people who are what we call special consultants, mm -hmm. like a home economics teacher who deals with cooking, sewing, all of these things, a psychologist who helps to evaluate the growth of children, a sociologist who helps to evaluate what changes are taking place in the family. Then, of course, you always have to have a clerical staff, you always have to have drivers. The last group, which I think is the most significant group, is the tremendous 
staffing that we are equipped with by volunteers. Right. And these come, adults from Portland Junior League, from the Council of Jewish Women, from the mothers whose children are enrolled in the program, and then we also use a lot of teenagers who really are working and studying at the same time. Mm -hmm. Now, some of these teenagers work within the school setting, um, in with the preschool, mm -hmm. under the direction of a trained teacher. Some of them work with another segment of the family. They work with the young school-age brothers and sisters mm -hmm. of some of the families from the poverty areas. All right, that gives us a background. Uh, I'm involved in the school, too, you know. I got a wife. Oh, uh, yes. Now, uh, I did hear Helen at the meeting not long ago explain her philosophy very beautifully. I also saw her in action with teenagers who she was trying to, you know, who are going to be teaching that this summer, who she was introducing to the problem. And we've talked to any number of people involved on any number of levels at the school. So uh, let's now look at a sequence in which the nursery school, which is people, in effect talks for itself, speaks for itself. See, our project is set up on really two basic philosophical points. One, we believe that these children ought to be integrated with all other children. That um, this is true democratic form. Secondly, that much learning takes place one from the other. And that if you have children, this is why we integrate handicapped children with normal children. That the stimulation provided is by the child who may not be handicapped in one area or may have more enriched experiences than another will reflect upon this other child. Secondly, we recognize that the child, the young child, is a dependent human being, and that the greatest reinforcement for his learning will really not take place here, but will take place in the family setting. And so our purpose in going to the home and our purpose in involving the parents in all kinds of activities, and you know by the calendar, a variety of kinds of things, is to help totally provide enrichment to every single person who's part of that family. Uh, and they've done what they're studying. So then when we go into the home, we hope the mother and father or whoever else is going to detain some attention and they try their hand, get involved in making collages, reading a story, coloring, cutting, questioning, all of this. Thing. This is the whole philosophy on which we're based. How do we communicate with each other? That's the only way? Uh -huh. Let me give you another thing. Let's say you all walked into this room and none of you knew each other. And we came around this table and we sat here for one solid hour and nobody said a word. Can <laughs> any of you tell me very likely what might have been happening in this room? You don't think it's possible? Could any of you tell me? Come on, Jean, you're, you're grinning about something. Come on. What do you think? What are the other ways in which people communicate? You're saying something. Come on. Say it some more. Come on. That's just a little cue. Come on. We study each other. What are we going to study? Faces. Faces? What else? The way we the clothes go. The clothes? What else? Is it only the face? But they we are compressing ourselves in words. Yeah, they are in a way. All right, but how? Come on, Dale, how? Just their actions. But they're, we're sitting. Well, but they can still be moving yeah, around the room or fidgeting with their fingers. Or so what are you going to be looking at? Movement. Their whole body. I mean, when I first came here, I don't think I'd let them, you know, be as fast, you know, do what they wanted to. I think I sort of, I don't think I did the right way. I don't think I was right. But then after I, I started getting a little more easy and all that, and I, I experimented more with them. You know, like I, I, like I used to climb in the jungle gym. I didn't do that at first. But they wanted me. I mean, it seemed like Mark, Mark wanted me to climb up on the jungle gym with him because he couldn't get anybody else to it sometimes. And he wanted me to. And I remember countless times when I sat in that sand pile playing with him. I mean, <laughs> I was just covered with sand, and I felt like such a dope when I come on the bus because, you know, seeing a sandy kid walking. <laughs> like, I don't know, I sat there in the sand pile and if they wanted me to help them make a big mountain and move all the sand out of the sand pile over just to a little pile there, I'd do that with them and I wouldn't do that at first. And I don't know, they sort of brought me out. I think they, I'd do what they wanted to after a while and then 
like on the slide. They wanted somebody to slide with them to and to catch them at the end of the slide. And so I did that sometimes. I went down the slide. I mean, you know, and all that. It's, I don't know, I just did things with them instead of looking at them. And I felt like a ghost sometimes, but I did them. With us, when we plan programs, we think of the needs of each individual child and plan the program in that way so that we really make an effort to whatever the particular problems that the child has to help the child overcome it or to, if the child has a particular ability to help them develop the ability, etc. And uh, we try to have each child really attain whatever he's capable of. You know, we, we try to help each child do what he can do best in the best way that he can do it. I think it has helped uh, my child, Tammy. She loves it. She goes to school. She comes home. She tells me, look what I made, Mommy. And they make all sorts of things with popsicle sticks and macaroni and rice. And she says, I'm going to say this and show it to Daddy. And she just loves to do these things. And I'm a volunteer teacher there on Tuesday morning. And, but I go to a morning discussion group. And this is for handicapped children. And I have one that's Linda. She's a little handicapped. And Tommy is also. And this is a wonderful discussion group. This is just, well, it's really marvelous. I mean, you go there and you say, well, you can say, this is wrong for my child. No one's going to look down and know because something is wrong with your child. I mean, they're going to say, well, you know, well, you're not good enough, you know, because you have a child that's handicapped. They don't do this. You can lay your cards on the table and say what you feel. That's what I like about it. Each child has, each child has his own particular needs, whether he comes from uh, a home with lots of things to offer him and lots of things to play with and lots of cultural advantages, or whether, whether he comes from a home that seems to be lacking in this, they, they, each child needs, has a need which appears to be very evident there at the school. And uh, some children you think they don't need anything, but when they're there with the others, you realize that, that they are finding things to challenge them in the same way that others are. This is one thing that the center does with the Head Start. They work with the whole family and not just the child. And it, if you can't work with the child's family, there's no sense in working with the child from the way uh, they work it and that I can see their Tell me, does it, does it make you feel better to feel that you're included in the activities that, that your child isn't just going to school and going off into another world and developing and growing while you're sitting back and not doing anything? I, I think it draws the whole family in and it makes the whole family a part of what the child is doing. And this, I think, is important because otherwise your child isn't going to be helped at all. And um, Mrs. Cosby has a teacher come and visit her, mm -hmm. and I have three or four children that I visit quite regularly. Uh, one of the reasons that we visit these children is to help them so that they will be ready for school, to really enforce this idea of having a Head Start program. We bring different materials from the school with us. We bring crayons and paper and paste, and we cut, and we sing, and we read stories. And we laugh, and we love, and um, I, I think this is, for me, this has been one of the very enriching parts of the program, too. And also, in the first place, I wanted our youngest to be in nursery school where there were people of different colors and different backgrounds. And this is why I chose this program. I didn't really know. I, I also hoped I wouldn't have to volunteer this year. I was going to take a holiday, but as I say, <laughs> <laughs> Helen fills in for me. The thing that I think has been fun, really, is not only working with you ladies, but also with the EOA mothers. I feel, I think we all feel that, oh. that they have been friends and that we have worked together, mm -hmm. that we have planned together. Uh, that we've learned from each other. All the things Helen said we ought to do when we started out, and I think when you first talked about it, you know, and it seemed so overwhelming to a lot of us, certainly to we me. We didn't know where to begin. We didn't yeah. know where to begin. I don't think any of it was impossible. Really. But it, the one thing that it did have, I think, was different, uh, and I think we probably all feel this way, was that it somehow didn't sound do-gritty. 
I'm just we weren't my sitting hour. up here on the throne telling them what we thought they should mm -hmm. do. It wasn't the idea, I'm going to give my hour and then forget about any problems that my community has. It was, we will work together to see if we can help with these problems and help each other and work together and learn from each other. Can you see a difference in point of view now at the beginning of the program? We thought none of us would be very comfortable um, in a social situation with the families. Now it seems to be quite easy. Mm -hmm. I think that feeling has developed through the, the birthday friendship. parties, and, um, which, is, which are more social than some of the mm -hmm. others. But uh, those who have come most regularly and who seem to have appreciated the program the most, as you say, are now our friends. Well, if you disturb any of the background noises, we shot all this on location, and this is just part of the noises you hear in the nursery school and around the Jewish community center. Helen, uh, from what I just heard, this isn't a do-good operation, she says, you know. Uh, so uh, you're not really trying to prove anything about democracy and anything. All you're trying to do is, this is a practical way of going about it? it is. What do you really mean by mixture? You seem to be well, mixing so much. What we say is that, um, for any human being who lives in any community, the services of the community ought to be available. Now what we found as we began to explore about whether we should apply for an EOA grant and do this program, through this red book, you know, we read, and I remembered way back when I grew up in Chicago and was going to college, I did some of my field work in the poverty areas, but you know, I'd forgotten, I was guilty of omission. Well, I rediscovered for myself some things. One, it's as though people are living in a, a box. Mm -hmm. It's lonely, and the doorknobs that to you or me are very visible are not visible. Let me give you an example. I think this would be the best way. As we were interviewing 120 different families, we knew we couldn't serve them all. The building isn't that big. We could push walls, but we couldn't push them that far. I began to discover that a lot of the families had had some problems with law. But you know, when you talk to them, some of the women knew that there was a courthouse, but they didn't know. It was somewhere downtown. What happened in the courthouse, they didn't know. Well, you and I know what happens in the courthouse. We could probably, without even looking at the bulletin board, tell you on what floor you registered right. a vote, where's the courtroom. Well, we discovered that certainly here was the place. And one of the first that our committee, our Family Activities Committee, which is made up, mm -hmm. as you heard some of the women say, of both middle-class mothers and mothers from, who are not mm -hmm. middle-class, right, right. from poverty, they went to the courthouse and they got to a trial. And then when they went downstairs to register to vote, and this is Portland, not Mississippi, do right. you know what the first question was? What do you, doesn't it cost you money? <laughs> and when that question was answered, then they said, and again, if Portland, not Mississippi. They said, well, what do you do with it? Do you know, Andreas, as, as a result of this program and our being able to talk mm -hmm. about what you do, many more people got registered. In fact, two of the mothers became registrars and got other people registered. All right. Now, in effect, what you're saying is that it isn't just the poor who live in boxes. All of us live in boxes. When I talked That's about right. there being many Portlands, you're trying to connect That's in your right. own way. That's right. Uh, people in the Junior League, people on poverty, people are all you know, uh, really ecumenical school. That's N right. Not just racially or religiously, but in terms of class, too. And this whole problem uh, of mixture is also of concern to the teachers, and they talk about it. So let's now look in on a regular weekly teachers meeting at the nursery school. And we've had an integrated program now ever since the school has been in the center, and this is about uh, nine or ten years now. And uh, we've never had any problems as far as integrating the children. It's the adults that see the, the problem, but not the children, because uh, it seems I've been here for five years, and it seems that uh, uh, every child that we've had, and no matter how handicapped he was, uh, whether it was a physical handicap or mental, uh, the children saw him as one of their companions, and Helen always tells the story that what happened before I came here, that one of the children, we had a child who couldn't speak, and so the other little child moved up and said, uh, why can't uh, Anne speak? And so uh, the teacher said, well, she didn't learn how yet. And so the little girl says, I'm going to teach her. The teacher says, how? And she says, by talking to her a lot. 
<laughs> so you see that they, they really don't see the difference. It's the, I think it's the adults that differentiate where the children learn to. That, for instance, this one is white and this is black. Can I um, take issue with you on that? And I'm going to use a personal example of my daughter, who's a very bright little girl. But her world, before she is a member or a part of this project, before she came into this project, was a, a completely Negro world. And um, this was due to the fact that that's where we live and these are the people she associated with. And we had great difficulty with her coming into the project. She came, she went, she goes to the flower because she just, she didn't know how to associate. She wasn't going to associate. And she's very aggressive little girl. I don't like her because her skin is different from mine. I won't, do, she won't be my friend because she's not a Negro. And well, it took a lot of coaxing on the part of the teacher. It took a lot of coaxing on, on my part. For one thing, I never recognized because she had never been out of the area. And I, I'm sure that if I had, a, if she had gone from our neighborhood and our home into a public school, probably a predominantly Negro public school, I would have never known the problem existed. Well, and the teacher would have never bothered to tell me, or maybe we just wouldn't know because she wouldn't have had to associate. Um, and it took a lot of coaxing on the part, my part and the teacher's part. And finally she's come, come the full circle where she does recognize the difference. She um, recognized the difference before, but she's question. ready to accept the difference now. I'm going to ask you a question. Was there any talk in your own family about the differences between the Negro and the white? And, and any discussion about it? Because it seems that these little children, when they are three years old, as they use, I think it's three, uh, really don't differentiate between skin. Yes, they do. I don't. I have no, never. We've had children here. Lisa, she has never. Uh, up until the time she was three years old, she came to Fruit Farm. She had never known white children. She had never known white people. And naturally, when she sees them at the age of three, and this is a very new thing to her, she's going to say, "Well, she's different from me." But I had to tell her story. Just look, she had one trouble. In the class she was in, there was one little white girl and several Negro girls. And she was saying, well, we're not going to play with her because her skin is different. I said, look at me. Is her, does she have two eyes? And she said, yes. I said, well, does she have a nose? Yes. Does she have a mouth? Does she run and play? And she says, yes. And I said, well, what makes her different? She said, well, she's people, isn't she? <laughs> and, and I'm very glad that she had the chance to see this and very young, and I think that all children... Well, of course, there's always going, there are always going to be exceptions, you know. I don't think this is an exception. I think there are exceptions. And I think this is one of the main, uh, this is one of the main attributes of our program, that these children are, are able to see the difference and able to see it very, very young. Well, that these children, although their skin is different, yeah. are the very same as they are. But and yeah, and it might work the other way in that... So many times yeah. I've seen children go up to a Negro child mm -hmm. and touch him. Yeah. 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 And and, and, and uh, this is how they the non see, but it's not judgmental. It's not that they're bad, worse, but it's just that no, the I, difference I, is there. I yeah. want to say that, that, of course, the problem exists. I didn't say that it's all wiped out, and I know it exists and it's probably going to exist for a long time. But I, my feeling is I'm speaking about schools, depending on how you present it. Uh, to the child, you know, whether when you envelop them into a group in the school, what kind of approach do you have? Because most of the uh, the characteristics that children bring, they bring them from home. We've had children here that pointed out like to a Negro child and say, he is chocolate brown. Well, I found out afterward that, where did they hear the word chocolate brown? At home. But well, that wasn't that judgmental, it was just it something that... No, that but he also, look, but he also and, and I all child, it's a, all children see it, and all children yes, might say it. I, Some I children are more verbal my, than I just want to finish my, my remark. This little boy said that this the other boy chocolate brown. Nobody made any remark about it. I was right there around the table and I pretended I didn't hear what he said. What did I do the next time? I brought a book to school where there were white and Negro children involved, and, uh, and we spoke about it. We talked about a story and I said, oh, I don't like to read a story from the book, you know. I like to show pictures from the children who read the story. And, um, and we wound up, by the time we were through the story, we wound up that everybody loved each other. And they were all going to invite each other to their, to their <laughs> <laughs> school, which in their, yeah, before yeah, they yeah. didn't. 
I mean, of course the problem exists. I didn't say it didn't. But you see, when we when we take him in and uh, make him feel that they're the same as the other person, then it gradually disappears. Yes, they were the There the are a few other This is what problems. my point, that, that all children notice the difference. And that they see the difference. Some children are more verbal than others. And some children will tell you where other children won't. And a, a program like this that shows them that the difference is not that. And there's also been a great change in race relations. I had one uh, family that uh, wouldn't allow me in their house for almost a month and a half because they, uh, the father said that you know, they didn't want any children in the home at all. And so they began to watch the progress of the child, how she, you know, she accepted me as a teacher. And so um, it took, I guess, about a month and a half before they would allow me in the house. Well, now, you know, everything's just fine. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. If you start thinking that you have to have a, take up an attitude about it, you're right going to here. be lost. You're visiting human beings. And the, just as Debbie said about her daughter, the things that we have in common are many, many times more numerous than the things that are separated. And if you just talk to people, you never have any trouble. Now, Helen, it's all very nice to say you want to involve people, but how do you involve people? This doesn't come happen just like that. You know, Andres, I wish the person sitting next to you could be Rose Taylor, our social worker. Uh, she's in the hospital I know, right we're sorry now, she can't be here. and we're sorry she can't be here, and I hope she sees the program. I hope so, and I hope she gets well soon, That's too. That's right. Um, Rose Taylor's been one of the major persons, not that no one else has been involved. And you know, I remember, and I try to put it down, something she answered to you when you asked her a question once when you were visiting our program. You said to her, what makes this program unique? Yeah. And you know her words, as she put them that time, the first thing about it is that you're interested in people. And you said something like, so what? Everybody else says yeah. they're interested in people. And she said, you see, a lot of people have said we're interested in you, uh, in deprived people. And you know what they do? They hand you a welfare check or somebody, some other things. But a lot of these people, even with a welfare check, have no self-confidence. They've never been allowed to try their skills at something. Somebody's always judged them and said they're no good, and then they right. offer no help together to work out things. I think that's the essence of our program. We have great respect for people. We have, we think every person has an opinion, and if you put all opinions together, you're going to come out with a composite that's better than just your opinion or my opinion, anybody individually, and together you can work. Now, how do we do a start? I think the first thing we did when we interviewed families, did we said, what are you interested in? What do you hope for your kids, for yourself, and so on? We found that some people wanted cooking and some sewing, and some wanted to learn how to make decorations for their house. We found that some of them would like some training for jobs and other things. And out of this, then we brought some of these people together with some of the people who had better knowledge of the resources, some of the middle class people who didn't have to worry about the bus fare and knew how to get there. And together, they took everybody's ideas and put them to work. So they planned trips, they planned skill classes, mm -hmm. cooking, home management, budgeting. Uh, how, what's the best thing to buy in a store? Even cake decorating. That's right. Cake decorating, sewing. People have made children's clothes, clothes for themselves. They've learned how to mend. We even made soap out of fat because yeah. if you've got a lot of children in a family, Buying soap is an expensive thing, and this soap, by the way, is good for your skin as well as your clothes. So, in effect, what you're doing, you are reaching out for people. That's right. Now, there's one other thing, though, Andreas, I should tell you about, and that is that one of the, con you know, our focal point is still a child. We are a right, nursery right, school, right. and so I think Mrs. Peck has said that what we do is the teacher goes, we used to call it our magic box. She went and goes with her magic box of things that you can use at home, and many of these she leaves. And we found parents trying their hands at reading and making the pictures and cutting, and all of the things. Now, what also got stimulated is that 34 of the individual parents, these are mothers and fathers, are now working with tutors, mostly out of the Reed College mm -hmm. Literacy Program, not only in reading, some of them in arithmetic, mm -hmm. so that they're getting added skills at homes that never before had a library card or never had a book now have books and newspapers and they go on the trip to the library. Well, again here, it seems to me the best testimony is when we can hear it from the people themselves involved. So let's now visit some of the homes and some of the people that are directly involved in this. Sorry by accident, because um, 
I had a child going, and my husband was on this uh, war on poverty committee. And I, since I was involved with the Jewish community, so then Helen asked me would I take the job as a neighborhood aide because I lived in the Albany area, and they were going to take children from that area too. And I told her I would think it over, and my husband said, well, this is a good chance for you to get away from home and do something, you know, for the community and get involved in community activities. So I said, okay. Well, first I go in and I introduce myself and I tell them what I'm doing. And usually, maybe, uh, if they have coffee on, we'll sit down, we'll have coffee. But uh, the usual approach is we're just going for a visit and we are seeing what the parents want. And we're not asking, you know, we're not, we're asking more of their opinions of what they want in the program, uh, what activities they want to uh, participate in. And, uh, but uh, it's just more of a, just, I should say, just a visit. Just though you're going into, into a friend's house and we, you know, we talk about children and whatnot. And, and um, I've learned quite a bit from the parents myself that I really didn't know. And we saw quite a few things together. We believe that we should do this together. We're not trying to go in and say, you know, I'm here as Mary Morris Neighborhood Aid, and uh, this is what we want you to do. We are asking them what do they want to do, or, you know, what do they want out of the program. You know, uh, before now, or uh, before this time, mm -hmm. they have never been asked to be involved in nothing, uh, regardless of what it was. Uh, even your school, and the child going to public school, the, 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 child, the, the parent has been sent a notice, or PTA, or other, uh, other activities in the school, but they've been sent, but never asked. So when this parent has sat back, uh, they figure, well, nobody cares about me. You know, and, uh, while I'm on welfare, or uh, I'm in this fixed particular mm -hmm. predicament, so no one cares about me. So then, once you come to this parent and you say, well, now here I would like for you to be involved into this program uh, to help your child. So then they still, they want to, just now, what do they want with me? You know, uh, what's in it for you? How much are you getting paid? I mean, are you using me? Do you want to write a book about me? You see? Uh, 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 what advantage is it, is it for you to do this for me? Now, if you tell some of these people that this is for your benefit as well as it is for mine, because my child has to play with your child, so that if you would raise your child properly and I would raise mine properly, then we will have a, a, a nice uh, 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 situation for our children. But then they always start to think, what's in it for you? You know, how much are you getting paid? Well, when they have that attitude, how can you get to them? And then how can you get to them when that attitude is, what are you going to give me? That's right. You say, you can That's turn right. it around, how much can I get other than something that is really beneficial? Mm -hmm. Because we have to face this, we are trying to help them face the future. That's right. What's going to happen? See, I think about tomorrow, after all of the programs are over, mm -hmm. have we actually helped them become independent. And I think by letting them do for themselves some, we'll make them independent. They yeah. will be after it's all over. That's right. And they them, will be. Showing them they, where to go for help. Yeah, where yeah. to go for help. I put the issue mm -hmm. right before them. Uh, I told them, now, this, you, you're always saying that I'm on the short end of the stick. Mm -hmm. Now, here's a chance for you to move up on the stick. Get out and do for yourself. One. Because yeah. you, you sit down and you're asking some, you're telling somebody, well, I can't do this and I can't do that and, I, and, and, and this is too much for me and that's too much for me. But yet you sit down and you say, I'm on the short end of the stick. So now if you're going to do something, this is your chance to do something on your own for yourself. This is one time. Then you can show them. Now if you want to, you say you're on the short end, it's a chance to be alone by being able to do. You will have to do. Nobody is going to do it for you. And as I say before, stop treating the kids low. You now, put the issue there. If you want it, get it. Sure, yeah, that's true. Now, I found in visiting the home, a car here and a car there, and yet I'm driving, you know. Mm -hmm. So then I said, now, this is a daring thing I'm going to do. And <laughs> you said, you get it. But God, I'm going to do it. Mm -hmm. 
And that will let me know if they are interested or not interested, right. you see. Mm -hmm. So I did it. I said, now you'll have to get to uh, Mrs. Uh, uh, White. On your own. And I came. And all of them were, well, yes, now, no, wait, I'll, I'll talk with my husband. Do you think that you can take me over? Mm -hmm. And Mrs. Germany can't pick me up. And I heard him say, yes, I guess so. And the next one, I guess so. And all of them were there before I got there. And they all felt that they wanted to organize this club. Mrs. Schur decided that the name of the club should be the Gadabout. And the members thought that that was pretty good because they didn't want a title of a club pertaining to work. So it became the Gadabout. So we all meet on every Monday at 12.30. We have coffee hour. At least we drink coffee during our discussion. I left it up completely with the mothers, just what they actually wanted to do. So they all decided that they would crochet, and that's what we are doing today. We decided that we would go alphabetically in visiting in the homes each Monday. We wouldn't just visit one home. We would visit each home, and that would encourage the mothers to kind of do a little bit more work <laughs> in preparing for us. And some of them had never been members of a club. So it seems to me as if they're very thrilled, at least that's the way it appears, and I would like to see some of them kind of talk on it, because I've always been in favor of us helping ourselves. And I think actually we have, because we plan to learn how to mend our clothing. We plan this summer to take our children on picnics, we plan to celebrate our children's birthdays. We plan to take our children places they have never been before, such as Jackson Beach for one. And I found also that the mothers would love to go there and sit out on the grass and just enjoy the park. We also plan to just not make it a point of having a big picnic basket, but just get together anything during the middle of the week and just the parents go out. This is a pleasure club plus learning. And I have found with these mothers that they will discuss most anything in a small group. And we have discussed affairs here that I'm sure that we couldn't have done in a large group, in a larger, much larger group. So it seems this that they are on their own and they're enjoying themselves to the highest. I hope that we will accomplish making a uh, pot holder. That's what we're trying to do today, is to make a pot, make pot holders. Mrs. Sir has a little knowledge of crocheting, so she's a great help in the club. Mrs. Curtis has some knowledge of it, and she's doing real well, and Mrs. Uh, Griffiths, I'm awfully proud of, came this morning, or today at noon, with her work, and she has learned to change beautifully. Mrs. White is still scuffling with hers, but I'm sure that, that uh, after today's meeting that we'll be on the right track with her. Now, what else have we done? Could we have something from some of you? How much do you really like your club? Well, I enjoyed it very much. Yeah. I enjoy going to different homes because I get different ideas of how to uh, keep my house and how to uh, get different things in the house. So many things other people have I don't and I don't know about. And crochet, this is one thing I would like to learn. It seems like it's very complicated. <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, well, I learned to meet different friends in this club, different people. And I really enjoy talking and dis discussing different things, uh, different problems with a group of people because they have different ideas uh, 
to help you better in living. So. Well, I have a son go to uh, the Jewish Community Center, and I go down there two days a week. I take sewing and cooking, and I really, enjoy, really have enjoyed myself in going. And I've learned a few things in going to the sewing class. I learned how to make a dress. And going to cooking class, I learned how to make different types of food, different kinds, and uh, things that would help uh, vitamins, so forth and so on. I only have one child, and he's kind of selfish, and he doesn't know how to play with other children. So in by him going to the school, it would help him to uh, learn how to get along with other children. And I think he is learning. I think he has the ability to learn, and uh, I want to increase it. And that's where I'm going to go. My children, actually, I think it's done wonders. I actually think it's done wonders. It's, uh, it has uh, made uh, Karen, my five-year-old, more loving, not so selfish, and also a happy-go-lucky type. She Where was. before she wasn't so happy-go-lucky. She was more just inside. Even if I have to be on welfare, it's not due to my uh, fault. It's not due to my husband's. It's due to circumstances beyond our control. I was sort of proud, but uh, my husband wasn't too proud. He wasn't uh, the type of person to smile even though everything was going wrong. Mm -hmm. Now since we've been attending the side, he feels like smiling no matter what. Well, when I first met Mrs. Gary, uh, Debbie brought it to my house, and I really didn't have anything. But it just, it didn't seem like it mattered with her. She just came on in and sit down and start talking. And, well, at first I was kind of shy. Mm -hmm. But it, it didn't make any difference then. She just came on in and started talking. And, oh, gee, and I felt much better because she makes you feel like you have something when you don't. <laughs> Sometimes I go two or three times a week. Most of the time why I do go so much is because of my little girl. She just started and she really doesn't know the people too good down there. And she is a little afraid. And mostly it was she was afraid of the Negroes because she's never been around them and she didn't know how to take take them, and that they would come up and feel her hair and stuff like this, and she was a little afraid. So if I go down on the bus with her, and she knows I'm at the center, I think I'm in the center, at the center, <laughs> then, she, then she knows that I'm somewhere in the building, and it, it, it really helps her, because we took her to a doctor, and the doctor said she was, she was a backward child. And there were so many in the family that she was right in between. And she's not a baby and she's not a grown-up. And she wants something that is her very own. And so this is what the Jewish community is. It's her very own school. She has her own teacher and uh, her own school bus. And so when I go down there, instead of just sitting, I, I join in the cooking or the sewing or the discussion group, and I've learned a lot myself on how to do many different things in cooking, how to save, how to budget, and just just a lot. I've learned in discussion how to maybe take care of my children different, not yell and scream at them, and, and uh, if something's wrong with them, how to how to cope with it better. And so I'm learning just as well as, as she's learning. And this club 
it, it really does me good because where I live, my neighbors aren't very sociable and they don't want anything to do with me. Maybe it's because I live in the dirtiest house up there. I mean, it's unpainted and the rest of them are painted. They just don't want nothing to do with me and they're calling my children names and things. And, and when I get out, I just feel a whole lot better and I know that I do have some friends and that I'm not alone in this world. And so I really do appreciate people being my friends. I'd like to see these people three, four, five years from now uh, in terms of what's happening with them, what's happening with their children, others moving up. Mm -hmm. I think, I don't know how you'll ever know whether you've changed a life, because of course you'll never know what it yeah. would have been ordinarily, but I think you'll find that social contact, three or four or five years, mm -hmm. now will have been kept up, because yeah. I need to keep some that I've yeah. made up. Yeah. So I mean, mm -hmm. I'd like to get some of them better. There are a couple of people I've met here, you know, you want to get to know yeah. better. Now, and what happens uh, to people when they don't get involved? You must have that problem. What do you do? Mm -hmm. I would suppose one could say that really everybody's been involved to some extent. Not all of them have come out for classes or discussions. But you know, as um, our teachers have said before, and you've heard this, the teachers go to visit in every home once a week, at least once every other week. And what's happened is the parents or the grandparents and sometimes neighbors are there. And in every case, we have found that the parents are involved in this. Let me get some excitement. Uh, the teachers go visit in addition to the neighborhood aid. That's right, and in addition to the social worker and myself. But the teacher's job is to, what you call, extend the classroom into the home. This gives the teacher an added amount of time for working alone with a child. However, in most cases, it's not working alone on this because there are younger brothers and sisters. Sometimes when you're there, the older brothers and sisters come home, and pretty soon it's like running a whole classroom. And some of our parents have been so excited, even the ones who cannot, for one reason or another, <coughs> haven't felt that they wanted to or couldn't come out to some of the activities at the center, they've invited some of their neighbors in. And some of the neighbors have been coming to the center, too. And I remember one teacher, Mrs. Butler, saying that in one home that she visited, she felt like she was running an adult and children's school. At one time, there were 27 people in the house when she was working with the children, and everybody came over. And we found that fathers, not all these homes have fathers, then began to make some equipment out of orange crates and so on where the chi children could keep some of the things that the teacher had brought that they could keep at home. Now, occasionally the teachers have done some other things too, by the way, and the school has. We've had some special children and whole family trips. A couple of Saturdays ago, uh, 25 mothers and some fathers and 75 children, preschoolers and school age children, went on a Saturday morning trip to the zoo. Now amongst that group of adults were some of the adults who have not partaken in things at the center, but were able, when you brought the whole family in this way, to go on this trip. Our mothers are now experts on what's happened behind the cages at the zoo. I wish that some of the women on ABC that I had on last September had known about this. Maybe they did. Uh, uh, maybe more of this ought to happen. It, it seems to me yes. if you keep this up within five years, you're going to change this town. Well, I would love to see that happen. But it spreads, you know. I mean, right. uh, I That's can right. see it almost be a self... Uh, perpetuating. Perpetuating, self-extending sort of thing. One thing leads to the other, and everyone is getting involved now. I want us to look at one more sequence before Helen and I talk some more, and this has to do with the music class, which I love and some very important things are being said in. They first came here, they actually didn't know 
what to do or what to say, and as a result, they really were wild. And it was a very difficult thing to absorb them with anything but screaming and yelling. It took quite a while before we could pull them together so that they would really um, begin to hear. But as time went on and they found that this was really something that was theirs, they began to respond so, well, I think you saw some of what happened. But um, they have begun to feel it's theirs. Creatively, there isn't a more exciting person than children of this age in all areas of creativity. Little Ricky began to be aware of the difficulty I was having, and the sense of empathy in these children is tremendous. And so, um, Ricky, when he saw that Sylvester simply wasn't coming around and was getting worse and worse as far as behavior was concerned at that time, he looked at me and he said, um, uh, some Negroes are bad and some Negroes are good. And I tried quickly to uh, balance it out, and I said, well, but Ricky, you know some bad, some whites are, are bad, and some whites are good. And Jerry, a little Negro girl that was sitting close by Ricky, looked at me and she said, well, Mrs. Reinhardt, I'm going to tell you something. Some people's is good and some people's is bad. And this is the purpose of the whole school, actually that all people are people, their color and their religion and their creed and their way of living doesn't exclude them from being the most important thing there is in this is people. also in the structure of the program by running Mrs. Reinhardt's sequence, which we just saw last, this whole goodbye thing. Because it's true, isn't it, that this is really the end of what you're doing there at the Jewish Community Center. It's true. At the end of August, um, we are going to have to say goodbye to the project because the board of the Jewish Community Center faced uh, with uh, having to relocate its building and so other things decided not, voted not to apply for another grant to continue this project. Uh, so we will really be saying goodbye, not as beautifully as the children said it to uh, Mrs. Reinhardt, uh, but we'll, saying good, we'll be saying goodbye, hoping, as Mrs. Muir said, that, that we're going to maintain a relationship, but hoping more than that, Andreas, and that is that the other programs that may be developing for uh, children, 
and I think on all levels, not just the preschool child, must remember the thing that I said earlier, that unless you provide this enrichment with the thinking together of all the people, for every member of every family, uh, we're not going to give a head start to children. This is the thing, and this, I think, is the... Uh, it's a goodbye with an addendum that I'm adding. Yeah, what bothers me about this is that from my own background and all that, the Jewish community center seems like such a perfect place for this to go on. As you said, it seemed right for it, and that the Jewish community center will give it up. Well, I'm bothered, too. Um, I know that with what scholarship funds the Jewish community center has, and these are small, about $4,000 a year, some children and families will benefit. Um, will be involved in planning for their own benefit. But I wish that it were a lot more. Well, I hope it can be done. Is this an irrevocable decision? I would hope not. Maybe with a new building in the, uh, in the future, this could be again reopened. I understand they're going to move into the country. What better place oh, to have a nursery school? I hope not, because then it makes it very difficult to move people to the country. Oh. I think you can make beauty right in the corner oh, I, of the city. I think you can. I think what you have really shown is quite uh, the opposite of what we saw in the first one, that uh, lovely people can be made. You've got to make an effort. You've got to plan for it. A great deal of the other is goofing. You know, because I'm worried what's going to happen now to Mrs. Sherv, who says the Jewish community is her own school, you know. I mean, she feels at home there. What's going to happen to all these people? I would, four years from well, now. I would hope that Mrs. Sherf now has gotten this self-concept so that she can go come back and use the center, if she can, come to other places, and be deeply involved to take what, as you have said, the lovely person that she has become because she has a feeling that I can, right. that I, what I say makes sense, and put it to use wherever she is, opening doors of the many resources in the community there. And she's one of the active people in, you know, while we say beauty is not just the way you look on the outside, you, do you know that she's part of a beautiful club at the center? Oh, I know that. You know that. Well, uh, Another question I wanted to ask, are there many other places to do what you're doing here, involved to this degree with the parents? Anyway? Well, we've heard both from the regional office of economic opportunity and from some of the federal people who came to evaluate us that nowhere in the country had there been this involvement of people. Uh, now, maybe the lessons that we have drawn from this and the statements of the Mrs. Sheriffs and the others will help to point the way that without it, yeah. you can't get the head start. To get it reinstated, That's to get right. something like this going again. This has only been the beginning of this. There's a great deal more to it, but for tonight, this is all we wanted to do about it. I ought to add one thing here. This program was not really done by me, but by my co-worker, by Tom Taylor, who did beautiful camera work, who is responsible for this entire program, in effect, all the film sequences he shot, and he shot some excellent things that you haven't seen, we didn't have time for. Uh, this is then the last urban mosaic. It's been very rewarding for me. It's been one of the hardest things I've ever done. I thank you for your attention and for your response. Good night.